Thank you. What if uh, you had the opportunity to take the vacation of a lifetime? Time and money for once in your life are no object. You can go anywhere you want to go, do anything you want to do, uh, and what happens there stays there, okay? So uh, I want you to tell the people at your table if you could take the vacation of a lifetime. Now, you don't have to only go one location. If it's the vacation of a lifetime and you were going to go in style, here's what I want you to talk to folks about. Where would you go? What would you do? How would you get there? I'm going to give you about, I don't know, three minutes to have this conversation. So plan the vacation of a lifetime. Don't leave anything out, all right? Tell them where you go. Let's all talk. I'll give you three minutes and then we'll pick it up. Good. All right, you have 60 seconds. If somebody hadn't already shared, hurry up. Let's plan that vacation. 60 seconds. Okay. Now, real quickly, uh, I'm going to come around the room real quickly, and let's just hear some of the prime locations that you folks are going. If you're going to take the vacation of a lifetime, where are you going? Home. All right. Home. <laughs> As opposed to right over here, I heard around the world. That was kind of stereo. That was freaky. By the time we got done, we got all the places in the world. <laughs> They've gone all the places in the world by the time they finished. What are some of those places? Italy. Italy. Australia. Australia. Hawaii. Hawaii. Hawaii, the Maldives, where? Spain, Spain. Spain. Israel. Spain. Fuji. To the beach. How many of you just put a beach? <laughs> yeah, all right. How many of you put the mountains somewhere? In the mountains somewhere? Yep, yeah. all right, got the mountains, all right. And... Uh, all of these vacations that you put, uh, you were excited talking about it. I have a question uh, for you. As you were planning these vacations, uh, if for some reason, somehow, this vacation the, the, became a reality and somebody came to you and said, guess what? The time and the money are available. You get to go on this vacation. 
What are some things that you would have to begin to do in order to make that vacation a reality? I'll give you 60 seconds to talk about some things that would be on your list in order to make that vacation happen. Okay, right, real quickly now, in order to make that vacation a reality, what are some kinds of things you would have to start doing in order to take that vacation? Take care of the dogs, because the they're not coming with us to the Maldives, and you take them to the mountains, the eagles will eat it, all right, so you got to take care of the dogs. What else? Send the kids to grandma and grandpa's, because they ain't coming either. This is a vacation after all. All right. Where else? What else are you going to do? Buy a new wardrobe. Buy a new wardrobe. What is that? Get a passport. Some of these places you're going, not only a passport, you're going to have to get some shots. Some of these places you're going, before you come back from some of these places, you're going to have to get some shots. All right. What else are you going to have to do before you leave? Save some money. Well, we got the money. We got the money taken care of. All right. What else? The work that, that you would have been doing, you don't want to come back to that big pile of work, so you're going to have to make arrangements for somebody to take care of some things while you're gone. All right, here's my question. In order to take that trip, you would end up with a long list of things that would have to be accomplished before you could take the trip, wouldn't you? Would you feel this way about that long list? Well, crap. <laughs> about Look at all that stuff I need to do. No, you'd be excited, excited about it. Why? We show up at work every, every Monday and we've got a long list of stuff to do. How come we're not that excited about that list? <laughs> because we're not going to the Maldives, that's why. You know what the truth is? The very same kinds of planning tools, the very same kinds of things that you would have to do to take a vacation like that, we have to do every week. But we've lost sight of the destination. We're not excited about the destination. You've got people working every single week at your organization. They have no idea. They are not excited about the destination. They have no idea where they're going. How many of you know people where you work who have no clue where they're going <laughs> for lunch? <laughs> How many of you have ever heard this conversation in the last 24 hours? Where do you want to eat? I don't know where you want to eat. And if they don't know where they're going for lunch, here's a hint. I bet you they don't know where they're going in their job either. And we're going to talk about how to reconnect with where we're going. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you something. You can't find your edge if you don't know where you're going. And we're going to reconnect with rediscovering where we're going and how important this one principle is knowing where we're headed. How many of you have ever expressed a frustration with lack of time? I just don't have enough time. There just aren't enough hours in the day. Our oft-quoted friend Zig Ziglar said this, it's never lack of time, it's always lack of direction. And if we can reconnect with that destination and we know where we're headed, it's going to make a difference in everybody's productivity. I want to give you my favorite quote about time before we move on, and uh, you're going to love this. It's a quote by my uh, favorite uh, famous philosopher. Let me give you the quote first, and then I'll tell you uh, who it's from. But if you've ever felt hounded by time, do you know what I'm talking about? You feel like time is chasing you? Uh, here's what this famous philosopher says. He says, someone once told me that time is a predator that stalks us all our lives. I'd rather believe it's a companion that goes with us along the journey to remind us to treasure every moment because it'll never come again. Now, if we can turn our thinking and see time in a different way today, we're going to feel very differently about our outcomes. By the way, that famous philosopher was Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> but uh, don't let that change the way you feel about the sentiment because it's very important. Today, we're looking at time 
and we're looking at destination. And, and today we're going to be talking about some things that help us uh, uh, find our edge and help us be our best for our world. And, and I'm really going to be highlighting some things from a much longer session. So we're going to be blowing through a couple of things quickly because I need to lay a foundation for you to get you to a place today where you can talk about how you can be your best for your world. And uh, so uh, we're going to talk about where are we going and how do we do that. Um, when, when we look at this whole process of rediscovering where we're going, how many of you remember uh, Covey's first habit is be proactive, you know? In a nutshell, that means to take responsibility for where you're going and how you're going to get there. And so many people in today's world aren't taking responsibility. In fact, one of our previous speakers said, we don't live in a world of integrity today where people <laughs> fail to take responsibility for their own actions. And if we're going to take responsibility for where we're going and how we're going to get there, there are some things that we have to do if we're going to be able to do that. Uh, listen, life's a trip, and we are on a trip. I'm going to make a statement at the beginning today that will become clear when I get finished today, and the statement is this. If you want to be happy with the house you've built, you've got to be in charge during construction. See, time, life, is building blocks. And every day in your life, you're laying down building blocks. And, and that every day, you're constructing something. And one day, you're going to turn and look back at what you've built, and a lot of us aren't going to be happy with what we've built. And the only way to change how we feel about that is to get in charge of what we're building. But a lot of us, we are controlled every day by happenstance and circumstance because we don't know where we're headed. And if you're controlled by happenstance and circumstance, other people are making decisions for you. Happenstance and circumstance are making decisions for you. You won't necessarily be happy with the outcome. Have you ever seen people who uh, are not happy with their jobs? I, <laughs> I see that hand. Uh, I, do, uh, I do consulting in, in my work. In, in addition to training, I do consulting. And, and uh, sometimes I'm consulting with people who are very unhappy with their jobs. And one of the questions I ask is, well, listen, let me ask you, why are you working here? Do you know how often I hear this? Well, they had an opening. <laughs> well, so did McDonald's. If you're letting happenstance and circumstance pick for you, there's going to be a lot of unhappy days in your life. And we've got to get to a place that we take responsibility, not just for where we are, but for where we're heading. And if we do, we're going to do some things differently. I'll tell you something else that, that will become an unhappy moment for a lot of people. If happenstance and circumstance are making all your decisions for you, there will come a point in time that your job has made all your decisions for you. What, what about when there's no more job? What about the sad statistic we hear about all the time that the number of people that retire and within six months of retirement, what happens to them? Because their job was the only thing giving them meaning and direction in their lives. There's no more job. There's no more reason to live. They die. I had a lady in my session one time who told me that retirement was such a huge disappointment because it ended up being far too little money and far too much husband. <laughs> Look, don't put yourself in that position. We, we, we've got to have something that drives us other than just somebody else. Where are you headed and how are you going to get there? Now, in business, there's a tool that we use to help our organization determine where we're going and how we're going to get there. It's a business tool. We use them all the time, and they are called business plans or mission statements. All right, listen, a business without a mission statement is a business planning to fail. And uh, I, in my consulting, I often ask businesses, uh, I ask managers and supervisors, well, listen, let me see your, uh, your mission statement. Do you know how often I get this? This look like, uh, yeah, we got one of those. <laughs> Hang on just a second. And they end up, we end up at this filing cabinet that's been locked for years, and they lost the key, and we rip it open, and they pull out this sheet of paper that's turned yellow with age. <laughs> there it is! <gasps> no, it's not. <laughs> Maybe one day it was. You know, where are you headed? How are you going to get there? I, I love Mark Twain's quote that I have. If you haven't already found the handout, I've got one uh, for you in your uh, folder there. It says, where am I going? But Mark Twain's statement says this. You can't reach old age by another man's road. Where are you today and where are you heading today? If you don't know, you've got to find a way to figure that out. And, and listen, put it on paper. One of our previous speakers said... Uh, those people that put their goals on paper were more successful than the 97% that didn't. We've got to put this destination on paper. Now, I, we're not going to do this right now, but I want to show you a tool to help us determine where we're headed. Let me show you some things we're going to be looking at here real quickly today. We're going to look at this whole thing about destination. Where are we headed and we're going to talk about uh, that and how critical uh, that element is. Where are we headed? Then we're going to talk about the roadmap. 
Listen, a lot of the challenges we run into in our business and in our lives come because we weren't using the roadmaps effectively. In fact, how many of you have ever heard people talk about, I just feel like I'm spinning my wheels, I can't get any traction. That is specifically related to our failure to use roadmaps effectively. And so we're going to address that. But this first thing I want us to look at is destination. And I want to show you this tool that you can use to personally get a handle on where you are headed. And if you'll do this at a personal level, you'll have a grasp on how valuable this is for your organization. Uh, if you'll turn to page two in your handout, we're not going to do the whole thing, but there's a couple of these elements that I need you to quickly look at. If I were to ask you to make a quick list of the roles in your life that are important to you. Now, you don't have time here to make an exhaustive list, but if I ask you to put down the, you know, some roles that are important to you, if you're a parent, that would be an important role. If you're a spouse, uh, your role in your organization where you work would be an important role. If you volunteer in an organization somewhere. So take a moment and just put down anything that comes to mind, roles that you fill in your life that are important to you. I'm going to give you a minute to do that. And then, you've probably only got two or three, that's fine. As best you can, this is tough, guys, prioritize them. Now, it'll change day to day. That's why it's okay. Just put them in priority order. And a lot, look, sometimes people worry about this. They're like, well, what if my wife's not first and she sees it? All right, look, guys, <laughs> put her first, all right? Just settle that, all right? But uh, as best you can today, prioritize that list. One, two, three. Just put them one, two, three. Now, you would eventually do this step with all of those roles. I want you to do it with your number one role right now. Beside that number one role, I want you to take just 30 seconds and jot down these things. What are the things that if time and money were no object? Remember how we, dreamed, we were dreaming big about that vacation earlier? If time and money were no object, what are the things you would like to be, do, or have in that role? Don't worry about can it be done. Don't worry about how I'm going to afford to do that. Don't worry about I don't have the time. If time and money were no object, what would you like to be, do, or have in that role? Take just a moment and put down anything that comes to mind. Okay, your list might one day be more exhaustive than that if you will invest time in this. But I want you to pick one of those things that you thought of just there. And under section C, I think it is, I want to show you what I want you to do with that. I want you to translate that into a present tense statement as if it were already true. Let me give you an example. In my personal destination statement, which is made up of a few paragraphs, and each paragraph represents a different role that I fill, one of the paragraphs represents where I volunteer in some different areas in my local church. And one of the sentences says this, I sing in the choir and play in the orchestra. Okay, now I need to tell you something about that. <laughs> that's, that's not true at all. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do that. I, now I used to do that. Okay, it's not a lie. I used to do that. But when I started this business full time about 13 years ago, in order to get enough business under my belt so that I could support my family, the first two years doing this full time, I was on the road over 250 days a year the first two years. And the few days I was home, I didn't feel like going to choir practice, okay? <laughs> so I quit. And I, I didn't, and so, but now there came a point. Now there's about a dozen speakers that work for my organization now, and, and I send them out a lot more often than I go. And, and so my, my schedule, this year I'll probably be on the road 50 days in, the, in this business. So it's a lot more reasonable now. But you know what? I had 
developed the excuse into a really handy little thing. Well, you know, I, I travel for a living. I'm on the road. And, and so I still wasn't singing in the choir. But our church does this thing at, at Easter time called The Lamb, and it's this phenomenal production where, with all these still scenes when the lights come up, all these people are in these, and it's, it just tells the story in a remarkable way. And, and this last year when we sat there and watched that, I just, I just absolutely decided I'm tired of using the excuse. I want to do something differently. Instead of just talking about it, I wrote it into my destination statement, and now it says I sing in the choir. And look, here's the deal. I am the president of my company, all right? Who's in charge of my calendar? Who's in charge of my company? My wife, all right? <laughs> but with her permission, we have sat down and looked at my calendar, and we know when they're going to have that next Easter musical. Don't we have a hint <laughs> when the Easter musical might be? And we blocked off those days, and I've already talked to our minister of music, and guess who's going to sing in the choir this year? After 13 years, guess who's going to sing in the choir this year? But until I put it on paper and put it as if it were already true, do you know that there is, there is no filter between your, your, what your little voice in your head says to you all the time and your subconscious brain? Whatever you say to yourself consistently, your brain believes and goes to work to find a way to make it happen. So my, my excuse that I heard all the time was, oh, I don't have enough time, I'm always on the road. But now my voice is saying, because you read this all the time, you carry it with you and you read it all the time, my voice is saying this in my head, I sing in the choir. So even now on Sundays, I'll be sitting out there in the congregation in my head, I'm hearing this, what are you doing out here, you fool? Because my brain has started to find ways to make that come true. You've got to put it on paper as if it were already true, and your brain will find some ways to make that happen. But we, here's, here's how we do goals a lot of times. Here's how we do goals. I'm going to do that one of these days. <laughs> Put it on paper as if it were true. Now, pick one of those items that you've already thought about, and I want you to take 30 seconds and write a present tense statement as if it were already true. I'll give you time to do that, and then we're going to move on. And you will eventually do that with all of those roles in your life, and with all the things you want to be, do, and have. Then it says that you should add an above all else statement. Jack Canfield says, this is like writing your eulogy in advance. And he says, you put down on paper the things you want to be, the outstanding characteristics about your life, but they ought to be things that you have not yet achieved. And you write, above all else, I am a person who, and you put down, what do you want to be, the outstanding characteristics about your life, but you're not there yet. And you put them down as if they were already true. And then the last step says, read it and adjust it until reading it brings about a sense of peace and a sense of excitement, and they're both important. Let me tell you why. With all the options you have available to you today, it's easy to be working toward goals that are at odds with your core values. And you need to be able to write down goals and adjust it and, and finesse it so that when you read it, here's what you feel inside. Yeah, that's me. That's who I really want to be. Because if you're at odds with those core values, you will find ways to self-destruct as you work toward those goals. You'll find excuses not to reach those goals. So you need to be certain that those goals match your core values. And then the last thing says, adjust it until it brings about a sense of excitement. My question for you is, as you were setting up uh, your uh, destinations earlier in that little exercise where you were deciding the vacation of a lifetime, how many of you put places like a uh, Garland, <laughs> Rowlett, Dallas? You know, one or two of you put home, but you didn't mean home doing the same stuff you do every day. You went home doing something totally different than you've ever done. Why didn't we put Garland, Ralph? Why didn't, why didn't you put your Why didn't you put that? Because we're already there. And who's excited about taking a vacation to a place where we already are? Do you know that's actually one of the biggest failures of corporate destination statements? In, in flowery language, we put down on paper and, and put up on the wall for everybody to see a place that we already stinking are. And then we send it to everybody. Look, put this on your wall. Hey, look, everybody. 
It's our mission statement. <gasps> okay, everybody, back to work. <laughs> Who's it going to be? Look, I have a question for you. Toward any destination that you set for yourself, do you believe there are going to be obstacles along the way? If we didn't want to get there anyway, at the first obstacle, what are we all going to do? Whoops, we tried. <laughs> but if you are more excited about that, that, that destination than you are worried about the obstacles, listen, if you really were going to have a chance to go to the Maldives, if you were going to have a chance, obviously I'm interested in the Maldives, if, you, if, if you're going to have a chance to go to Fuji, if you're going to have a chance to go to Australia, and it really became a possibility, even as you planned it, don't you think there'd be obstacles? But how many of you think you'd find a way? over, around, through those obstacles, you find a way. But see, we've got people working with us every day. The, the destination we've asked them to arrive at doesn't sound to them like Fuji. It sounds to them like the same old, same old. You know why? You know what? Where most people in our organizations are headed every week? Honestly, you know where they're headed? To Friday. <laughs> That's where they're headed. And they know they're not excited about it because next week they're going to be on the same trip. <laughs> and they're not excited about it. We have to enlarge their sense of destination and help them get excited about we are in the process of becoming the most dynamic provider of and we are going to, they have to be, they have to buy into that. And by the way, uh, listen, Covey says if you go off by yourself and you develop your mission statement and they are not involved in the, in the development of that mission statement, they are not going to be involved in helping you get there you got to get them involved in getting excited about where we're going so that they can be involved in the excitement of helping you get there. Where are you going and are you excited about it? Listen, you better readjust and, and finesse your personal destination statement until you're excited about it because if while you are reading your own destination statement, you put yourself to sleep, start over because you're going to come up against obstacles. And if you're not excited about getting there, you're going to quit. And then you're going to go telling other people, it doesn't do any good to set goals. doesn't work anyway. All right? Get excited about it and see where it goes. Now, once we have that sense of where we're headed, and let me tell you, none of this other stuff works if you don't know where you're headed. If you're not bought in, if you're not excited about where you're headed, none of this other stuff will work. It's all based on that, that foundational principle of knowing where you're headed. But once we do that, now how do we draw the roadmap? Well, you're going to hate this. We use something called roadmaps, or what's the word? Goals. Oh, no, don't talk about goals. Just beat me. Let's not talk about goals. <laughs> Nobody likes to talk about goals. Here's the reason. In most of our lives, somebody else sets the goals for us, and to us, it just feels like a quota. It's something else we're not going to reach. It's something else they're going to bring up at our, at our annual review. You didn't get this done either, did you? All right? And we hate goals. But if you will see it as this, the destination is something we determined, we're excited about it, all the roadmaps are, all the goals are, are some steps we're going to take to ensure we actually arrive at that place that we're already excited about. If you will do the first step correctly, the goals feel totally differently. All right? Now, I'm, I'm not going to uh, rehash with you all of the things about goals. You know about SMART goals. I'll put them up here. They have to be specific. they got, got to be detailed. They have to be measurable. Listen, every goal you write has to have a number in it. If you can't measure it, uh, if it doesn't have a number in it, you can't measure it. If you can't measure it, how do you know when to quit? If I'm driving from here to San Diego, when do you stop driving if you don't have a number in your goal? When you get wet. All right? You got to have a number in your goal so you know how much progress you're making. How do you know when, you, when you've gotten it done? You got to have a number in your goal. Your goals have to be action oriented. I told you earlier, we always think about goals like this, you know, well, I'm going to do that one of these days. Tony Robbins says, you haven't actually made a decision on a goal until you take action. That's when you've made a decision. And if I'm writing a goal, on the day I write the goal, I'm going to take the first step that day. You got to take action. One of my uh, friends that works for my company, uh, his name is Bill Abair. he tells a great story about making a decision and taking action. Uh, and Bill's fun to listen to because Bill grew up in South Louisiana. Now, I grew up in Louisiana. Bill grew up in another country called... South Louisiana, right? <laughs> and it tells this great story about taking action and making decisions. It's a story about three frogs on a lily pad. Okay, three frog on the lily pad. Okay? Okay? Okay, three frog on the lily pad. Two of them frogs decide to jump off the lily pad. Okay? Okay, okay so how many frogs left on the lily pad? How many? Not three. Because they only decide to jump off, they don't actually do it yet. <laughs> now, 
For us, our lily pads are our comfort zones. And we get so comfortable on there. Even if we decide to jump off, when we start to get up, we hear the ripping sound of that Velcro, then what do we do? <laughs> oh, it's deep out there. You could kill yourself out there, yeah? Right? So we have to take action on our goals. Uh, they have to be realistic and they have to be timed. Now, here's what I want. I'm going to give you two additional things to put on, on your uh, goal roadmap. 